Hello guys and gals, and this is part two of our reading of Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And I do have the art the author's consent to read this book on my YouTube channel. And if you would like confirmation of that, then that can be achieved by emailing me at the PayPal link in the description. Anyways, as always, we're going to go over the copyright information anyways. I don't really know much about this book, except that I found it at a thrift store and it looked really cool. It says right here, all rights reserved in copyright 1985. This is actually a first printing, it looks like. Interesting. So, anyways, in the last episode, we met Zach, who... um basically works for the Capitol building, or the principal. And um, they are collecting young girls, apparently. And he is at this girl's home, and they have quite a few kids. Uh, the guy is a brewer, a brewer, I believe. He brews ale. And um, that's about all that we know. Let's uh, pick this up where we left off. We're about to meet... I think that I, I think that I was mispronouncing the name. I believe her name is Evie instead of Evie. I don't think that she's a Pokemon. So I'm going to be calling her Evie from here on out. Eat your porridge, Marson snapped at the boys. The five young faces turned from the door and to Marson. Day, Day Eve. I think that I'm also mispronouncing that name. I think it's Day Eve, not Dave. It's Day Eve. Day Eve looked down at his bowl and began to eat. Zach fought the urge to walk out and ride away as fast as he could, far beyond the borders of the district. He si he sipped from his cup and nearly choked. The liquid was bitter, heavy, and savory. He set the cup down. A strong tea, he, he murmured. I picked the herbs myself, said Marson. It's not to everyone's taste, but it will wake you up. Marson drank deeply from his own cup, and Zack gave it another try. The bitter warmth sp spread through his body, calming him. He began to eat the porridge, surprised how rich it was. The four young children ate greedily and, and unselfconsciously, while the older boy Pick, the older boy picked at his breakfast, stealing curious glances at Zack. Marson continued to sip tea, the porridge in front of him untouched. There was a scream from outside. Then the sound of a slap. What's the matter with Evie? Asked one of the younger children. Not receiving an answer, he turned back to his breakfast. Finally, Marson spoke. You must understand, he said. We are very poor. Zach tried to think what to say in answer. And then the little man added bitterly, but I'm sure you've heard that before. The fact remains, since Evie's first father died, we have nothing, not even enough food for our children, and when we, we manage to earn, oh, and what we manage to earn is taken away almost as soon as we get it. What choice do we have? He stopped speaking abruptly, looking down at his cup, then drained it. Henny, Henny wants more, Pa, said Dave. Give him what's in my bowl, then, said Marson, and he got up from the table and went to the fire, where he began to make more tea. The silence was broken only by the noise of the children eating, and Zack was certain he could bear oh and Zack was certain he could bear bear it no more no longer when the door opened and the woman came in, her face grim, her eyes red rimmed behind her was Evie. um Zack had been about to drink the last of his bitter tea, but the cup stopped just as his just at his lips, and he set it down again and and stared. In spite of the dark circles under eyes, which had spent many hours crying in spite of the too pale skin and dazed expression, this was the most striking girl he had seen in his life. Her her long hair was drying. Oh, her long hair just drying was the was the rich brown of freshly turned earth mixed with golden strands that reflected the feeble morning sun, and her eyes were a dark were as dark as plums. She was thin and tall and moved with a presence more 
accentu accentuated and more perhaps the basis for her beauty. Come along, Evie, said the woman. The girl looked up, and for a moment the plum-colored eyes met Zach's, and he felt a chill go through her. Go through him, rather. Ah. I'm getting tongue-tied. Then she looked away and sat beside her mother at the end of the table. This is Evie, said the woman. Evie, this is Zach, who will take you to the capital. Evie did not answer. A bowl, of por a bowl of porridge sat at her place, and she looked down at it, but did not pick it, pick up a spoon. No wonder Zach thought the principal had sent him to this far corner of the district. Though, though the principal's tax men could, could not have begun to describe Evie, they surely had made clear how extra, extraordinary she was. Perhaps he thought a wild Dina was in the girl. Please eat, love, said the woman. You have a long journey. Evie didn't move. Zach couldn't take his eyes off her. Mar Marson, bring some tea, said the, wo the woman. Marson, who all this time had stood by the fire, approached slowly like a man sleepwalking and put his own cup in front of Evie. She put both her hands around it and, dr and drank. Zach saw her grimace as if she knew, as if she were forcing herself to drink the bitter liquid as a kind of penance. There were red and blue, blue bruises on her wrists, and Zach realized with shock that she had been kept tied waiting for him. At, as last night, he could no longer bear to sit at the table. I'll get the mount ready, he said. In the yard, Zack stood with his back to the cabin and took three deep breaths. The forest was now green in the sunlight, and he tried to calculate how far they could ride and where they would stop. But his mind wouldn't cooperate. All he could think of was the girl. The bruises on her wrist, her shining hair, and the plum-colored eyes, which had met him met his wants. He went to his mount and adjusted the saddle and replaced his things, making room for more ha more bundles. When all when all was secure, he ducked back into the cabin and announced, It's time to go. The children were up from the table now, all but Dave and Evie. Dave looked puzzled and apprehensive. The woman was bent over the table, tying a wooden satchel while Marson again stood by the fire, his back to the room, Evie sat, as before, looking down at her untouched bowl of porridge. Zack took the bundle from the woman and stepped outside again, grateful that he would never again have to enter the room. When he had tied Evie's things securely to the mount, he turned and stood waiting. After a moment, the door opened and the woman came out, followed by Evie and then Marson. Marson turned at, turned at the door and muttered, Your sister is going on a trip. Stay here. Evie seemed to be in a trance. Is her mother, oh, as her mother led her across the yard, the almost formally off, oh, and almost formally offered her hand to Zach. He felt a physical jolt with his fingers closed, oh, when his fingers closed around her wrist, he drew, and he drew her forward. Have you ridden a mount before, he asked. Suddenly, with surprising strength, Evie pulled her hand free and ran to the door, but Marzen was blocking it. Please don't send me away, father, she sank to her knees and threw her arms around the little man's legs. Marzen stood, unmoving, his face pale, but without expression. The woman was even paler, and she spoke through tears. Marson, she said. Perhaps we know, said Marson. Then, then go with him, Evie. No, please, she stood and looked at him. I can, I can earn money by trapping, father. I know how to do it already. Dave will help me. Marson didn't answer, but stood, but shook his head, then turned his back on her. Evie turned to the woman. Mama, don't make me do it, please. Let me stay. She was now sobbing. Her words, 
and Zack watched helplessly, his heart breaking for all of them. At the la- at la- at last, the woman knelt and gave Evie and held Evie in her arms. We love you, Evie. Evie, sorry. I, I forgot that I was pronouncing it Evie now. Please believe that. I think that Evie is short for Evelyn. Then don't send me away. We don't want to, but it's best for everyone. Please try to understand. I don't understand, the girl cried. You don't love me, and I hate you. She began to run across the yard, but Marston was close behind her. He pulled her, crying and struggling to Zack. Take her, he said. Tie her if you have to. I won't tie her, said Zack. Then, very gently, Evie, please, I don't want to hurt you. Marson pushed the girl towards him, and Zack reached out, steadying her. Though still sobbing, Evie was no longer struggling, and he held her a moment in comfort, then lifted her onto the mound. He swung up behind. Put, put your legs over, he said. Mechanically, she obeyed him, that, and then settled down b- back between his arms. Her narrow back nestled snugly against his chest. You won't fall, he said. But if you get frightened, you can hold on to the mane. The girl seemed not to hear him. She sat stiffly, her body shaking with sobs. Zack turned his mount towards the forest and rode quickly out of the yard. He did not look back. Chapter 3 Zack rode mechanically, trying not to think. He was aware of the warmth of the girl between his arms and thighs, and as he urged his mount on to greater speed, Evie's hands reached out and grasped the mane. Make sure that's okay. The mane, okay. I will not do this for him, he thought. I will not do this for him, he thought, but continued to ride steadily, guiding his mount through the hilly woods. At last, the labored breathing breath of the mount and his own hunger forced Zack to recognize that it was time to rest. He reined in to a shady clearing by a shallow stream and dis- then dismounted and reached up to swing the girl down. She didn't resist. When he set her down, her knees buckled and and he steadied her. Come over here, Evie, he said. Sit down. He led her, he led her to a moss-covered rock which overlooked the stream. She was no longer crying, and she looked at, and she looked at the ground, breathing deeply. Zack took them out to the stream where she knelt to drink. Behind him, he was aware of the girl and wondered if she might try to escape. He whirled at a sudden sound, but she sat as before, and overripe fruit had fallen from a tree. He must try to make her eat. He couldn't bring her sick and ema- emaciated to the principal. Her mother had said that she hadn't eaten in two days, now three. He still had a bit of hard cheese, which he had been saving. He approached the girl and, and smoothed a place in front of her, then spread a large new vine leaf as a plate. On this, he put a bit of cheese and some of the bread her mother had sent. Evie sat like one of the remaining statues at uh, statues in the capital. I'll get you something to drink, Zack muttered. He rinsed his drinking horn in the stream, filling it with cool water. He held it out to eat Evie, but she seemed not to notice. He tried not to let his exasperation show. It's, it's a long journey. You may not have much time to eat or drink later in the day. After a moment, she reached out and accepted the horn. When she had finished, she held it to him for more. He refilled it for her. She had shed many tears and must be thirsty. Evie drank most of the water in the second horn, then gave it back to, to Zack. He finished the water, then squatted just to the side of the rock, not facing her. Your mother's bread is good, he said conven- uh, conversationally. He bit into a piece of cheese and continued. If there's time to hunt later, I'll try to get a rabbit. Would you like that? He paused. She didn't answer. I don't imagine you've you've tasted meat many times in your life, have you? He waited again, but the girl remained still. He felt his annoyance growing and turned to see if she were mocking him. At his sudden movement, she stared back. Uh, she started back with a small cry. Zack's anger vanished. Don't be afraid of me, 
Evie. I won't hurt you. He pulled off another piece of cheese. He had eaten little at the brewer's house and was hungry. When he had finished, he leaned against the rock. He could sense the girl's eyes behind him, staring at his back. If only she would talk to him. The principal, of course, would, wouldn't care if she talked or not. He might find it more interesting if she didn't. After a few minutes, Zack rose and walked a short distance into the trees to relieve himself. His ears were alert for any sound Evie might make, any movement to escape, but when he returned, she was sitting where he had, le had left her. He looked down at her, once again struck by her unusual beauty. Perhaps he could simply turn his mount around, return the girl to her home, tell the principal he had been unable to find her, that her family had moved from the district or been murdered by outlaws. But of course that wouldn't do. The principal could discover the truth sooner or, la sooner or later, and that would mean the end to Zack's lifeblood, if not his life. He, we must get going, he said at last. Will you eat? Evie hesitated and reached for the bread and cheese. Before he could stop her, she stood and threw them into the water. Her face was sullen and defiant, and Zack had to suppress his anger once again. She knew how scarce she knew how scarce food was, and that was why she had made the gesture. Come on, then he said, and walked towards his mount without looking back. He pushed the mount faster than he had that morning, once using a leather thong. Which, uh, when she began to slow, he had lost time trying to get. Evie to eat and didn't want to spend more than one night awake tending a fire. The mount began breathing in gasps and Zack slowed. Ashamed. It was, no, uh, it was no use taking out his anger on the beast or on Evie. Neither had any control over her life. Not even as much as Zack had of his own. The shadows were deep by the time they reached the eastern slope of the mountain. Zack nodded to himself in satisfaction. If all went well, they sh there should be no difficulty reaching the foothills by tomorrow afternoon, and then they could relax and have a good night's sleep. He had been following a narrow stream and now began to look for a suitable spot to stay for the night. At last he found a small clearing, well protected by trees. This is our inn for the night, Evie. How do you like it? The girl didn't answer, and Zack swung her off the mount, then unloaded the tethered beast oh, unloaded and tethered the beast by the stream. While Evie watched, he set he set about making the campsite safe and comfortable. After preparing a shallow pit for a fire, he smoothed away the stones just in front of the of a tree and swept a heap of dried leaves over the ground. This would be a bed for Evie. He realized with surprise that he wanted to please the girl. He even thought he even he had thought all fatherly feelings had died fifteen years ago. As Zack worked, Evie watched him silently, still brooding. At, la at last he stood up, saying, Now I have to gather wood for our protective fire. You may help me if you like. He thought that she wouldn't respond, but evidently she felt she had a stake in her own survival, or simply wanted to move about, and she followed into the woods, stooping as he did to pick up dead, dried twigs and branches. Zack, he stopped in surprise and turned in the direction of her voice. It was the first time she had spoken to him. What is it, he asked. I found a large log, but I can't move it. Let's have a look at it, said Zack. He went to where she stood and examined the object. It was thick and dry and would be ideal for a long-lasting fire if fire oh, for the long-lasting fire he needed. But it was half buried in the ground and would take some work to move. This is a fine log, he said. Why don't you take the kindling we've gathered back to the camp while I try to pry it up? Without another word, she accepted the branches and the branches he was holding, and turned back to the clearing. Zack dug under the log with his knife and pushed and pried 
till at last it came free. With some difficulty, he hefted it upon his, onto his shoulder. Then he returned to the, camps, the campsite and placed it on the side of the fire pit he had dug. He sat a moment to give his to get his breath. He was more tired than he had realized. The hours he had spent with the brewer's family had drained him. I'm going back for more kindling, Zack told Evie. Do you want to come along? She shrugged, then stood and followed, followed him. In a very short time, they had gathered enough for the night, and Zack was about to turn back when he heard a sudden noise in the brush to his right. A rabbit. Think the Dinas, he thought. Quick, quickly, he unslung his bow and fired an arrow to it, drew and let the arrow fly. It caught the rabbit through the throat, just as it started to run, and Zack felt unreasonably proud of himself. He was seldom that good of a shot, and was pleased that Evie had witnessed it. It was deep dusk by the time Zack had started the started a fire and prepared the meat. Evie hadn't spoken again, but he felt she was relaxing a bit. The smell of roasting rabbit made his mouth water, and he smiled to himself as he caught Evie taking hungry glances at it. While he waited for it to finish cooking, Zack leaned against the tree and looked at the sky. One by one, the stars appeared, twinkling pale blue. Puffing on his pipe, Zack thought how good it would be to live, to live as people had before the change. In another kind of world, he might be sitting like this with a family around him. He thought of Leia and the brief happiness they had had together, and for a for a moment, his eyes m misted. If she had lived, they would have had children, perhaps even a daughter like Evie. In the firelight, Evie looked like a portrait he had once seen in an ancient book, her features so delicate and soft that they seemed to be lightly sketched in the air. Zack had counted the money paid Evie's parents, and he knew they had the principal seen, that had the principal seen her. That he would have offered ten times the amount. By the time Zack had finished his pipe, the meat was done, and he set it on a flat stone and began to cut. It's ready. Evie, he said. Gravely, she came over and knelt by the stone. It smells good, she said. Too good to throw in the water? She gave him a swift glance, but said nothing. They ate in silence, hungrily. This was the first substantial meal Zack had eaten in over a week. There had been no no opportunity to hunt on the trip to, to the brewers. After dinner, Zack bent over the stream and washed, then drank from his horn. Evie refused his offer of the horn and instead drank from her cupped hands. He put the remainder of the rabbit in his pouch and slung it from a tree branch to protect it from fox cats. Okay. You better get some sleep, Zack said to Evie. We have a long ride tomorrow. Evie didn't answer. She settled herself on the bed of leaves and he had that oh that he had prepared for her, and sat with her arms around her knees, her cloak over her shoulder, staring at the fire. Do you mind if I play and play my instrument? He asked. Was that what I heard last night when you came to to our to my parents' house? It's called a feather, a feathered lyre. I never saw one before. Not many people have. My new oh, new plants and animals make new instruments and new songs to be played on them. Before the change, there were hundreds of different instruments for making music, and thousands of songs. Do you know any old songs? She asked. Just the folk tunes that everyone knows. There's no way to ever know the other ones. That's why I made up my own. Would you like to hear one? She nodded. Zack smiled and stroked the strings. Evie watched him, squinting across the fire. He had won the lyre ten years ago, gambling in the principal's camp, before the president had been defeated. The lyre usually took years to learn to play, play well, but he had picked it up right away. The uniquely mournful quality of the lyre sound had immediately seemed to suit him, 
and his nature. He started another tune, then happened to glance at Evie, at Evie, tears were sliding down her cheeks. With a pang of guilt, he stopped playing, then took his time putting the lyre away. That's enough for tonight, he said. Time for you to go go to bed, young lady. I'm not a child, said Evie, and I'm not tired. After a moment, she lay down on a on the blanket Zack had spread on her on her bed of leaves and pulled her cloak over her. Zack waited, oh, wanted to smooth it around her, but stayed where he was. When will you go to bed, she asked. I have to make sure the fire stays bright to keep bats away. But you have to sleep, she said. Perhaps I'll doze a little, said Zack. I'm used to it. Good night now. Evie didn't answer, and Zack shrugged. On the trip to the brewer's house, he hadn't needed to keep a fire going. The one night he was in open bat country, he had simply constructed a very small leaning shelter, used his cloak and some branches, then built a small fire near the open end. The glowing embers gave enough light to keep bats from flying directly at his head, while the lean-to protected his body. This arrangement necessitated staying in the tiny tent from the time the sun went down until it rose again. Though Zack had considered making such a shelter for Evie, he couldn't be sure that the girl would obey him and remain still all night. Besides, he knew it would be uncomfortable and frightening for her. Zack purposefully remained where he was. The ground and the tree he was leaning against were bumpy and slightly damp, uncomfortable enough to keep him awake. For the same reason, he did not pull his cloak around himself until his teeth began to chatter. After a while, he got up and stretched and laid more wood on the fire. It was becoming, it was becoming quite cold, and he extended his leg toward the warmth. His legs towards the warmth. It would be tempting to stretch out just for a moment. We are going to. Um, Stop the stop it right here. We are getting to a good place to stop, I believe. We have been reading from Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And um, so far it's really, really good. And I know I haven't read this book before. And this is the first time I'm reading it is on the stream. So anything that happens is going to be news to me. Um, but yeah, as I've said before, I have the artist the author's permission to read this book on my channel and um this book is probably still for sale at most bookstores um if you want to grab yourself a copy or at, at the library but anyways um we have been reading this amazing book and if you like this content make sure you you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you don't want to upload and if you want to support me in any way all that information will be in the description below as always thanks for watching everyone and have a great day